It's Noah from the theater. One of our ushers has decided to no-show for the evening, and we need you to fill in for our Midnight Madness block. Our film-goers are being restless and need someone to rein them in. Make sure you dress the part, but be as heavy-handed as you need to be. This isn't a kid's movie. The theater is at 555 Driver Street. I hope to see you there. It says a lot that my first time laying eyes on Hotline Miami was from an old Rooster Teeth Rage Quit video, back before Ruby was even a thing or the collapse of the company as we know it now. You wanna know what excuse he uses for sleeping with underage fans, despite being married for over a decade and having kids, and just throwing all that away to get with underage girls? He uses the Mando Pony excuse that he wasn't given enough attention from his wife physically and emotionally, so he would go after underage fans who looked up to him and would give him anything just to talk to them and would just make them have sex with them. But I'm not here to talk about either of those things as they aren't Hotline Miami. When I first saw it in action, I didn't think much of Hotline, though that was because I was a small brain child who didn't see the appeal of it. A few years later, when I was a minuscule brain teenager and had my first gaming laptop, I saw it on the Steam storefront and figured, hey, that looks cool. I'll give it a shot. Thank you, teenager self. There are two starting points for Hotline Miami, seen as there are two major influences on the game, the first one being Super Carnage. I shouldn't say influenced, as Super Carnage was the prototype for Hotline Miami. Developed in between 2004 and 2005 by Jonathan Soderstrom and Game Maker 5, Super Carnage was a rough outline for Hotline Miami. This wasn't Soderstrom's, I apologize for my inability to speak Swedish, first game he had ever developed, as he had developed games since around the early 2000s under the pseudonym Cactus and released them onto a multitude of web forms, but I'll get back to Jonathan after closing out the fate of Super Carnage. The game did come out in 2006, but it was only a singular level, a level that would become Full House and Hotline Miami, and the AI pathfinding for the game frustrated Jonathan so much that he stopped working on SC. Many of the ideas introduced in Super would be later reused in Hotline, such as floor plan based levels that are only cleared when every enemy is dead and clothing items giving special abilities, but I can't say if the game was successful or not due to it being freeware. I can say that about Jonathan himself, however, because in 2007 he would release the game Clean Asia, which would earn him nominations in Excellence in Visual Arts and Excellence in Audio in 2008's Independent Games Festival. <laughs> The following year, at the Game Developers Conference, he would deliver his four-hour game design speech, which was an expose on how he makes games. However, back in 2008 under the Cactus moniker, Soderstrom would give an interview with Keith Stewart of The Guardian, detailing how long his projects took him to complete. When asked that question, Soderstrom explains that his games have been reasonably small. Most of them are one-day projects completed within 24 hours, but some have lasted for up to a few months of development time. I usually do a significant portion of the game the first day, so that I can see the results and get motivated to work more on it, or simply finish it up. It's in this same interview that Jonathan mentioned mentions David Lynch, a director who not only inspired two of Soderstrom's games, Mondo Medicals and Mondo Agency, but would serve as one of the major inspirations for Hotline Miami. The last thing to note about this account is that Soderstrom mentions that he wouldn't mind developing games for the big three, the Xbox Live Arcade, the PlayStation Network, and the Virtual Console. Following his success and talk at the GDC, Soderstrom would team up with lead singer Dennis Wedden of the band Fucking Werewolf Asso in 2011 to develop the game keyboard drum set Fucking Werewolf to help promote one of the band's songs. It was this meeting that would end up forming Dinaton Games, Den and Dennis, and At In and Jonathan in 2012. Jonathan, despite easily busting out games like I Do Nuts, didn't make any money from them, thus he decided to take on a much larger project, ringing up Dennis to be his partner in crime. True to his dedicated philosophy, Jonathan and Dennis completed 
completed their new game, Hotline Miami, in the same year they formed their studio. All that was left was to get a publisher, their choice being Devolver Digital. Back before they were known as the giant indie publisher that they are known as today, Devolver only had three games published under their belts. Serious Sam HD Gold Edition, Serious Sam 3 BFE, and Serious Sam 2. I don't have much to say about those games, as I'm not an unjustly incarcerated YouTube reviewer who's bad at Doom, but it's not like Serious Sam was well known to most people even though it does have importance to the boomer shooter genre. Group Team are a bunch of wizards, but that's for another video. Not really. Being released to the Steam storefront on October 23rd, 2012, Hotline Miami was a success as it would get ports to Linux, OS X, and PlayStation 3 and Vita in 2013, PlayStation 4 in 2014, Switch alongside Hotline Miami 2 wrong number in 2019, and Xbone in 2020. I haven't mentioned the other influence yet for Hotline, and that's because I honestly don't have much to say about it. Major aspects of Hotline are inspired by the 2011 film Drive, such as the plot and characters. You don't need to know anything about Drive to enjoy Hotline, but if you've seen Drive, which I recommend, it's phenomenal, a lot will seem familiar. I'm not saying that's a bad thing though, I mean, you can tell that I wear my influences on my sleeve. The version I played was the Steam release. I'll start this off by saying this isn't going to be a timeline explainer video. If that's what you want, Squatch Gaming Official has you covered. I'm more focused on telling you what happens in the game and my own interpretation of what the core ideas presented by the story are. With that out of the way, we open up on a tutorial from a hobo telling a jacketed figure how to kill people. This is entirely for gameplay purposes, but since we will never learn the name of the character we'll be playing as, I designate him as Jacket. Following Jacket's murder tutorial, he awakens in a darkened room, possibly near where the Red Room lies. And just like that ephemeral space, there's a bunch of weirdos waiting for him to show up. Three to be exact. A caring woman in a horse's mask, that I will dub Don Juan. A quite inquisitive man who claims to know Jacket wearing a rooster's mask, dubbed Richard. And a loud, standoffish guy in a white suit who's also wearing an owl mask, Rasmus who can't stand the sight of Jacket. As such, Rasmus has nothing to say to Jacket, but Don Juan claims that Jacket won't want to know why he's in the darkened room while Richard provides a bit of context. This hasn't been the first time he and Jacket have met. It was April 3rd, 1989 when they did. Flashing to that date, Jacket receives a phone call from a person by the name of Tim. Tim has delivered cookies to Jacket's address, but that's code talk for a rubber rooster mask, the same as Richard's, and instructions for a target Jacket needs to hit. Sure enough, Jacket goes to the local metro to acquire a briefcase, killing many people along the way, including a passerby hobo, which causes Jacket to throw up. He's okay with murdering the white suits, but not a hobo. Interesting. On his way home after dropping off the briefcase, Jacket stops by a local Quickie Mart to grab a snack, but also ends up having a conversation with the bearded cashier. The two seem to know each other and are friends, but their chat is utterly vapid. Like with Jacket, we won't learn this guy's name either, so I will label him Beardo. It, it's actually Beard, but for those who get my reference, this won't be the last one to that character. Nothing happens for a few days in Jacket's life until the 8th of April, where he receives a flyer for a newsletter he subscribed to. It's from 50 Bless. Uh, well, we don't know what they are, but they have America on the mind. Granted, seeing this and the other newspaper clippings I'll bring up later is optional, ascertaining to the audience that Jacket may not care about what they're selling. He does get another phone call, but these are all coded messages for Jacket telling him to go hit another target, which he does so with vigor. And like before, Jacket stops off before heading home, this time to a pizzeria where Beardo is also working at. Man gets around, though I would suppose it's because he keeps getting fired as he gives Jacket a free pizza. Another set of days pass before Jacket is called into action on April 16th. Before answering the phone, Jacket examines a newspaper clipping he left out on his coffee table. It's about his massacre he did eight days before, though because he was wearing a mask when he exited the building, Jacket is described as a monster. Listening to the phone call and heading over to the given location for another bloodbath, Jacket easily stomps his opposition, but he does find a dead man wearing a walrus mask. 
Seems that Jacket isn't the only one connected to 50 blessings. His pre-apartment stop is more productive too as at the VHS store, where surprisingly Beardo is working at as the cashier, we learn that apparently everyone that Jacket has killed has been Russian. Beardo seems to rejoice that the so-called Ruskies are dead, so much so that he gives Jacket a free movie. On the 25th of April, Jacket has another job to do, though before heading out he reads another article that describes the violence going throughout Miami as gang warfare. This slaughter goes a bit differently from the last ones, as Jacket ends up saving a woman who was a victim of sex trafficking. Why he did this, who's to say, but Jacket is not a complete monster, that's for sure. The midway stop this time is at a bar, though Classy Beardo doesn't say anything special to Jacket, so on to a second stint in the dark room. As with Jacket's last visit, the three figures provide some banter to the mute. Well, Rasmus doesn't, he just exclaims that Jacket isn't a nice person. Don Juan, meanwhile, prophesizes that a picture is being formed and then Jacket won't like the look of it before expressing that it's maybe just her while Richard provides our man with four questions. Does Jacket like hurting people? Who are leaving messages on the phone? Where is Jacket at this very moment? And why is Jacket conversing with the three? It's safe to say that we have an answer to two of those questions, though I couldn't tell you where Jacket is or why he's talking to the three. May 5th is when the calls begin again, but unlike the previous clipping, the one for today proclaims that Jacket killed a movie producer and that he abducted girlfriend. Hey, if Kevin Nash can be a snuff film director over in Germany, anything's possible, and that second part is a lie. Jacket's rampage goes unchallenged at his next target, though amidst the violence, he does accidentally kill another man, someone who is wearing an animal mask being tortured by the Russian mobsters. This isn't the only other agent of 50 blessings that Jacket sees for the night either, as when he goes to the convenience store, he spots a man in a wolf mask being shaken down and later killed by a group of made men. Six days after this night, Jacket gets another call for his service, and the article for today is about the explosion he caused during the 5th. Strange occurrences seem to follow Jacket at this point in time, as instead of heading back to his car after finishing his mission, he decides to take a crowbar he found on site and investigate the sewer's nearest target's location. To Jacket's and our shock, there's a man in the manhole as opposed to a mermaid. There should have been a warning next to the manhole that stated, Danger, crocodile! But Jones is on his last breaths, futilely exclaiming to Jacket that this whole entire scenario is a dream. Dream. Taking the Jones mask, Jacket leaves for the pizzeria before turning in for the night. The 13th is when Jacket is needed again, and the newspaper for the day reads that the police in Miami are denying that a vigilante movement that targets the local Russian mob exists within the city. Jacket's mark is a hotel, and as if to announce how important this day is, two janitors are seen by our masked fellow, one cleaning Jacket's apartment and one at the hotel. Side note, say hello to Jonathan and Dennis because these two characters are based on them. They don't say anything to Jacket, only ellipses at him, which is never a good sign. Tonight's conversation with Beardo is mostly filler, though he does confirm that there are more animals running around other than Jacket and all of them are attacking Russians. Ten days after the Hotel Blue bloodshed, another article about Jacket's escapades is released. Apparently, three Russian politicians were among the slain at the hotel, and seen as the rest were criminals, dealings for the Russo-American coalition have hit a snag. Of course, what this means is unclear, as we don't know if that is a good or bad thing. Keeping in line with what has happened in the past few missions, Jacket clears out the location he was told to go to, but gets another phone call on the job directing him towards phone home. Someone's been doing some prank calls, and 50 blessings won't stand for that. Heeding this new objective, Jacket has a showdown with a bike-helmeted, meat-cleaver-wielding maniac. Jacket comes out the victor, though I doubt this will be the last time we see Biker. The routine trip to the bar has nothing to note except Beardo mentioning San Francisco, though like with a lot of things in the story, the context nor what happened there is given. Returning back home, Jacket has another round with the animal trio, with Don Juan spelling out to our silent protagonist that his path will only lead to destruction while Richard provides predictions. Someone Jacket knows is not who they really are, 
something will be taken from Jacket soon, and that on July the 21st, Jacket will wake up in a bigger house. Rasmus, as usual, only berates Jacket. Brought back to the real world, Jacket assaults a nightclub on May 27th as per the message he gets from 50 Blessings. It's following this mission do the pit stop interludes start... going haywire. At the convenience store, Jacket hallucinates Biker's decapitated body before talking to Beardo. Another day, May 31st, another job, but shoving a monkey wrench into Jacket's murder extravaganza is the appearance of the cops at his target, forcing him to leave the vicinity in a hurry. Ducking the heat, Jacket goes to the pizza parlor, but outside is a dead mobster and a Cerberus-type bioweapon. Inside isn't much better, as Beardo has been replaced by a Baldi, who doesn't offer any freebies to Jacket. On June 3rd, Jacket performs his usual 50 blessings duty, but when he heads to the VHS store, Jacket runs into Baldi again, who is still as abrasive as ever. He also seems seems to know Jacket, but for what reason is unknown at the moment. Two days before the 10th of June, Jacket's hallucinations have tracked him home, but that doesn't unsettle our sociopath as he still heads out to kill some Russians. However, the phone message this time is a lot more awkward, as the person on the other line didn't know how to hang up properly. This mission is different from the previous ones because when Jacket tries to leave, a blue-haired man in a van tries to stop him, but doesn't. Heading to the bar, Jacket is kicked out by the Baldi as it's VIP night only, the VIPs being dead Russians. Making it back home, Jacket finds girlfriend dead and another animal, this one a rat, whose clothing looks similar to the Baldi's, sitting on his sofa. Richter, as that is the mask's name, not only killed girlfriend, but even kills Jacket himself, or as we find out from Richard and Jacket's dying dream, put him into a coma. Waking up from it, Jacket sneakily exits the hospital and plans an attack on the Miami police precinct to not only find the whereabouts of the rest of the Russian Mafia, but to have a chat with Richter. For the rest of Jacket's story, he follows the police's investigation notes to continue his hunt, ending it with the killings of the boss, his girlfriend, his two pet panthers, and the boss's father. Looking out from the boss's mansion balcony, Jacket throws away his mask, lights a cigarette, and contemplates over a photo before tossing it into the wind. Yet we're not done here, as flash backwards to May 13th, Biker is shaking down an animal at a bar, wanting a way out of the game as he has found it boring. 
Aubrey, the pig mask, directs him towards a Chinese restaurant, which Biker hacks through to get to the owner. Interrogating him, Biker learns that whoever is leaving the messages are using phone home to hide their tracks and that whatever their goal is, it's political in nature. Leaving the restaurant, Biker chills at his crib until he receives a message on May 16th pointing him towards an arcade. It's clear from it that Biker has stopped consistently doing jobs, though why he engages with this one might be him trying to figure out what the punishment might be for not doing them. That's because his next mission is on the 23rd of May, but instead of going to it, he heads to phone home to find out where the masterminds of 50 blessings are. Keeping in line with what happened on that date, Jacket shows up to have a duel with Biker, though this time our cleaver-wielding friend is the winner. I'll say here, as I'm not planning on covering Hotline 2, that the canonical version of this encounter is that Jacket won but didn't kill Biker, so both timelines do happen. The next day, Biker finally finds the source of the phone calls. The two janitors from earlier! When one spots Biker, he runs away into the sewers, allowing Biker to check the two's computer. It's password protected, though through magic, as only Jacket picks up the puzzle pieces that are the password, Biker figures that it's I was born in the USA. With the knowledge from the computer, Biker is able to question the two janitors about what 50 Blessings is all about, destabilizing the Russo-American coalition. Through threats of violence, 50 Blessings gets their agents to kill specific targets so that America can supposedly rise back up to its feet. If you want to know more, I'm sorry chief, that's all that is stated, so no context for you or me. Biker, being tired of bullshit, says he has heard enough as he has no interest in politics and hates having his time wasted. Paying the janitors back for boring him, Biker cleaves them up before riding off into the Miami night, ending the story. The theming within Hotline Miami lies within violence, how people view it and the meaningless of it. There are three major perspectives within the story, Jacket, Biker, and Fifty Blessings, and each one of them looks at the act of killing in a different way. Saving Jacket for last, as he is the most nuanced character within the story, I'll begin with Biker as his outlook is the simplest. Biker engages in violence as a way to figuratively kill time. To him, killing another man is a rush. Just by looking around in his house and going off the fact that he's a biker, it's easy to understand that Biker is a daredevil. This in lies Biker's dissatisfaction with what he's doing, however. Once he skydive enough times, there's no rush to it. Biker gets no enjoyment from flaying someone out on the floor of his cleaver because he's done it so many times and thus it has lost its luster. In a way, you could equate Biker to a drug addict, though his choice would be thrills, something he no longer gets, thus he wants to leave 50 blessings. With Biker, there is no greater meaning to his actions, even when he uncovers the conspiracy. And it's because Biker will never understand why people commit violence. It's the difference between someone who engages in something as a hobby versus as a career. To me, I think he is the best character to find out about the truth as it is ultimately meaningless, just like the actions Biker has taken. Biker's brutality is pointless and undirected because he has no legitimate reason to engage in the deed. All he can say was that he thought it would be fun, which can be a reason, but not for something of this caliber. You can say that about laser tag or monster girls, not stone cold killing a person. That's where 50 Blessing steps in. While Biker was aimless, 50 Blessing sees violence as a means of change. Their goal is to shift the balance of power in the Russo-American coalition back to America via assassinating key Russian figures and disrupting local Russian criminal ventures. In short, Blessings is a nationalist organization. I know hearing that word from me might be alarming, but don't worry, this isn't turning into a bread tube type video. Violence can be a profound source of change, yet it is a double-edged sword that can also lead to ruin. Not every revolution comes to pass, even with the aid of killing. Sometimes it just leads to more bloodshed and people outright rejecting the ideas you're spewing if they weren't already doing that before. There's more to change than just violence, thus basing a whole movement around it is short-sighted. Whatever goal 50 Blessings has is utterly moot, as killing a bunch of high-profile officials won't get a majority of people to join the cause. Sure, they'll get some that are just as fanatic as them, but that will be what makes up the bulk of the new recruits, as remember, both Jacket and Biker were a part of the organization and it's not like either of them cared about the mission statement. There will always be opportunists. Speaking of the mission statement, 
What is it? Yeah, someone can say that they're going to change the world, but that's a vacuous decree. There needs to be a detailed plan that gives reasons as to why and how someone would be able to accomplish that. Blessings has the why, not the how, the most important part of this equation. They can kill as many Russians as they want, but 50 Blessings won't achieve anything meaningful outside of being labeled a terrorist organization. The news clippings already prove that as such, as it describes the agents of 50 as monsters. There is a point that can be made that 50 Blessings is exposed that some of the members of the Russian part of the coalition are connected to criminal organizations, but you don't meet violence with violence unless it's the last option. There's also not a lot we can confirm about the coalition from these connections. So, some people of power entrenched in dirty dealings. Okay, water's wet. We don't know if these operations were meant to be a foothold into America or are just a business deal to get more money. Another thing in the air is that we don't know how many Russian politicians are connected to the Mafia. For all we know, it was only the three killed in Hotel Blue. Unless the entirety of the Russian side was all connected to the Mafia, killing disconnected gangs won't solve anything. We don't learn anything noteworthy because that's the point. What makes this even funnier, but not in the haha -ha sense, is that the scope of 50 Blessings is never given. The two janitors claim that they have friends in high places and there are different branches of 50 all over America, but you can use their own words against them. Sometimes a threat without a follow-through is enough. They base their whole entire phone operation and relationship with their agents on a lie, so should we really trust their word that they do have connections? There probably is no 50 Blessings, it's just another scare tactic used by two janitors angry at Russia for reasons unexplained. They are loud and boisterous, but say words with no impact. All that leaves us is Jacket. Completely mute and beset by strange dreams and lifelike hallucinations, Jacket is an enigma amongst the other characters. On one hand, he has an aversion to killing the innocent and goes out of his way to rescue someone in need. On the other, he's vicious when dealing with those he considers disposable, whether they be Russian mobsters, cops, or other 50 Blessings agents. It's apparent that he likes hurting people, but he's not one to attack unprovoked. He's not like Biker, who kills indiscriminately and for shits and giggles, but he's also not like 50 Blessings, as he's not killing for some greater force for change. What does he kill for, then? Well, the answer to that lies with whoever the bearded person is. Going off of the Phantom's words, Beardo was a friend of Jacket's, but emphasis on was. While we don't know what actually happened to him, well, we do because of Hotline 2, but I'm not talking about that game. It's a safe bet that he was killed by someone who is Russian or connected to the country. He does state his dislike of Russia during his first VHS visit, after all, and something clearly happened at San Francisco, though it's vague at best. This recontextualizes everything Jacket does, as he isn't a mindless slave to Blessing's will. He's only following orders because it gets him closer to revenge. This also explains his assault on the cops as well as killing Ratfink, though the motivation there was from the woman Jacket rescued. She wasn't guilty of anything, though that didn't stop our rat friend from putting two in her tin spot. The cops were caught in a bad spot, as not only were they holding onto information related to the Russian Mafia, but it could also be taken as that they were protecting Mr. Rat by placing him in a holding cell. Jacket doesn't bother himself with finding out the conspiracy as it isn't his port of call and it'd only get in the way of his righteous fury. Richard makes it seem like it is, but in the grand scheme of things, knowing what 50 Blessings is would do nothing for Jacket, which is the issue that the Birdman is trying to bring up. Jacket is being strung along despite the fact that he doesn't care for 50 Blessings' goal. Jacket is willingly doing the work of Blessings, so even though his own personal journey is separate from the Nationalists, he is quite possibly their best agent. Why else would he go after Biker when told? 50 Blessings was Jacket's easiest shot at the Russian Mafia, so them being kaput would make Jacket's plan of action quite hard to accomplish. Likewise, when Richter guns down Jacket, he heads to the police after waking up, as he knows that they have information regarding the criminal underbelly of Miami. Man gets shot by a fellow animal and winds up in a coma, but the first thing he does when he wakes back up is to continue his inane hunt. I feel that I don't have to explain the futility of revenge when it comes to Jacket's story, as even if Jacket killed every single last Russian-made man, it wouldn't bring back Beardo or Girlfriend. But what makes Jacket a contrast against his compatriots is there's an odd sense of closure for him. He well and truly accomplished nothing, yet I don't think we're supposed to view his ending as such. 
I get a sense of completeness from Jacket when he throws off his mask, lights a cig, and casts off the photograph he's been carrying, like a weight has been lifted off his shoulders. I may be romanticizing this a bit as the Don Juan and Richard within Jacket's dreams do infer that the path he's going down will break him, but perhaps this is the only thing Jacket could do. Granted, how much of this was his own making is still undetermined. Jacket had a chance to leave the killing once he saved Girlfriend and started turning his life around, but he didn't, either too motivated by his own retribution or worried that Girlfriend would be targeted by 50, which ended up happening. Yeah. However, I think the idea I want to get across is that you don't need to understand any of this or even think about what is going on in the story to enjoy the game. Hotline is built up from its gameplay, not the concepts it's trying to convey. Now, if you like the story, that's a okay, but don't you fucking dare try to seem smarter than you actually are by saying a multitude of people missed the subtext and that only you got it. We're playing a game, Chief, and we all either get it or don't care to, but our version of fun is not listening to a dissertation that says everything we like in the world is problematic and that we are are terrible people for enjoying something. Pixel art? In 2012? It's more likely than you think. If you haven't watched my Team in T 2003 GBA video, I'll give a refresher here. I love the pixel art style slash sprite work. Not so much in how it's used in today's day and age, as a lot of indie games use the pixel art style as a surface level way of saying that their game is retro inspired when that clearly isn't the case, but for Hotline, which I would argue is like a modern rendition of Smash TV, the sprite work fits. Not only is it done with vibrant colors, keeping in line with the retro wave look that swept through the early 2010s, it's varied as well. What makes the locales that Jacket and Biker venture through appealing as the floor plans are simple are the different little details in each. Fun and Games and Assault best exemplify this and might be the best looking stages in the game. Perhaps my favorite part about the attention to detail is seeing how some locations change, particularly the rest stops that Jacket goes to. None of them at the beginning of the game have a 50 Blessings logo, but near the time Jacket wakes up from his coma, they do. Of course, the levels aren't the only good part of the presentation, as the character animations are both crisp and savage. Even though this game is a top-down shooter with sprite work, I can feel the viciousness in every blow, especially since the aftermath is extremely vivid. This works well with the general color scheme of the game as the violence is highlighted against the neon colors of the 80s. What makes Hotline, however, is its sound design and music. Everything in the game sounds crunchy, helping to get across that this is ultra-violence we're partaking in. Guns sound as closely to their realistic counterparts as they can, while killed enemies give a wet, meaty noise, showcasing how easily torn apart they are. The cherry on top of the bloody presentation Sunday is, of course, the music. Each track is composed by a licensed musician, and the end result is one of the best video game soundtracks ever. If techno, club music, electronica, whatever is closest to dubstep without being that genre is not your thing, this listening won't be for you, but damn you are missing out. It runs the gamut between heavy beats to get you in the mood for killing to more laid-back tracks portraying the stereotypical Floridian paradise the game's location is known for. Hotline Miami is a top-down, twin-stick shooter where the name of the game is to kill everyone in a level quickly, efficiently, and... variedly? There are two characters to play as, Jacket and Biker, but seen as the only difference between the two is that Biker is locked down to melee only and has three throwing knives for range attacks, don't expect wholly distinct playstyles. Movement in Hotline is conducted with the WASD keys, while looking around is with the mouse. Mouse click left is the attack button, while right is the throw pick up button. Holding down shift allows the player to look farther ahead, though this is only useful in large rooms where enemies might be off screen. Spacebar is used on down enemies to initiate an execution, though some like the face smash done with fists and blunt weapon bludgeon require the usage of left click to do them. That's not the only action tied to spacebar, however, as when Jacket is unarmed, he can do a quick kill on a white suit if the player hits spacebar near them. The timing is a little bit tricky, and doing it in front of other enemies is a death sentence, but against singular threats, it's a nice way to keep the gameplay flow going. The last button used in the game is the R key. Get used to using it, as R stands for restart, and all it takes for Jacket or Biker to die is one hit. Kinda. I'll explain later. At the start of every level as Jacket, the player gets to choose what mask he will wear. Side tangent, masks are given to the player after completing levels and some are found in certain stages like Jones or Jake. Each mask, except for Richard, gives Jacket a special effect, like walking faster, more ammo and guns, higher combo time, or even doors being able to kill. What mask should be used is up to the player, as each comes with its own playstyle. A mask such as Tony forces the player to rely on blind corner kills since Jacket can only use his fists, but it also means not having to worry about having a weapon as Tony allows the player to kill big thugs and dogs with fists. Not every mask is useful, however, as the two bullet surviving ones rarely, if ever activate, and the more gimmicky masks like Tony or Don Juan definitely lose out to masks like Brandon. 
walking faster, or Rami, more bullets and guns. However, the name of the game is experimentation, so besides a few masks, each one has a place on the roster and can be used effectively if in skilled hands. So, for a majority of them, not mine. As stated at the top, a player must kill every enemy in a level to complete it, though some levels are broken up into two to three sections. Once a section has been finished, the next section opens up. Sections are generally completed linearly, though Hot and Heavy allows the player to choose what section two and three will be. Once every section has been finished, Jacket or Biker has to go to Car to finish the level. Located in all of Jacket's levels are pieces to the password used in Biker's final stage, though outside of a few levels, these letters can be picked up after every enemy has been killed. Moving on to the enemies, outside of the two bosses, Biker and the Mob Boss, there are only three enemy types. The White Suits and their color swap Blue Officers, Big Thugs and their color swap Detectives, and Dogs. All the enemies have attributes unique to them. White Suits are the standard enemy type and you'll be killing a whole heap of them throughout the game. All are armed with either one of two weapon types, melee or guns. Melee enemies rush the player while gun enemies shoot from afar. Like with Jacket and Biker, these enemies go down in one hit, though hitting them with either a melee weapon or Tony's fist is way more consistent than shooting them with a gun. See, sometimes White Suits and even Jacket and Biker can survive getting hit from a bullet. I flat out don't know what causes this to happen, though certain guns, the silenced pistol and any automatic firearm, are more likely to wound an enemy with a grazing shot. Despite me pointing this out, I've never had grazing shots lead to my death unless I was using the silenced pistol, a weapon that might as well be a nerf blaster for how pitiful it operates. The special attribute tied to the white suits is that they can be knocked down, whether by being hit by a door, a thrown object that isn't bladed, or by being punched by Jacket Sans Tony. There are two knockdown states, flat on the floor or braced against an object or wall. The difference between these two states is that Jacket has to execute white suits on the floor or let them get back up, while a white suit braced on a wall can be hit freely with any melee weapon or gun. Bladed weapons can sometimes knock down white suits, though more than likely it will embed itself into the mobster leading to a kill. There is a third knockdown state, but it's only when a white suit has been hit by a melee weapon. Rarely, this enemy type will survive being killed and start crawling around on the ground. A white suit who is doing this cannot fight back and needs to be executed. All this state offers is more points as the game considers enemies in this state to be dead. The last thing to note is when a white suit is knocked down, they drop their weapon. Unarmed white suits will cower from Jacket, but if a weapon is nearby, they will go over to pick it up if it's a melee weapon or gun. Big thugs are much taller and much wider than their white suited counterparts. As such, they take a lot more damage. Unlike their common brethren, big thugs have two characteristics, one they share with dogs and one unique to them. They can't be knocked down and can't be killed with melee weapons outside of Tony. To offset this, big thugs are limited to melee only and their health works as a running timer. Whenever this enemy type is damaged, their health starts to tick away. At what speed is determined by initial damage and if they are receiving any additional damage. It's entirely possible to kill a big thug with a few shots from an automatic weapon and then leaving them to bleed out, though bursting them down is the best option to take care of a big thug as when they are damaged, they beeline towards the player. Shotguns are incredibly handy when dealing with big thugs because of their bullet spread. The last enemy in the lineup are dogs. The only real noteworthy things about them is that they are melee only, extremely fast, and can't be knocked down. Take note that my phrasing of knocked down here and with the big thugs means that thrown melee weapons, whether bladed or not, are useless against them, doors have no effect, and forget about Jacket's bare fists if he isn't using Tony. Something that all enemies share is their attraction to noise. Whenever a gun is fired, an enemy might go to the source of the noise which can lead to either a combo continuing or mass failure if you weren't expecting that to happen. That means it is possible to home alone enemies by hiding in a corner and drawing them out, but whether an enemy reacts to a gunshot or not is up to chance. The game says that enemies are predictable and that is the case for the most part as each enemy on a floor has a simple routine that they will follow such as patrolling a set path or standing guard. However, sometimes enemies do wander away from their starting locations, throwing another variable into the mix that the player has to balance out. For as predictable as the enemies are, they are set on max pain for reaction time. If an enemy sees the player or catches a whiff of their presence, they will immediately commit to an action that their weapon allows them to take. Being seen doesn't mean instant death, but damn is it close. Getting the drop on gunners is super important because of this. Dotted throughout each of the stages are specialty environmental objects like doors and windows. Doors in the Hotline universe are the be-all 
end all, as not only can opening one up on an enemy knock them down, they can be shot open by shotguns. Leading enemies into an enclosed room if a door can lead to some shenanigans. Windows on the other hand are see-through walls that can be shot through. Be mindful when an enemy is near a window as that godlike reaction time can bite you in the butt around windows. Every action that Jacket does towards an enemy such as killing or knocking them down awards some points and starts a combo. Combos are dropped after a short period of time so once one begins it's advisable to figure out how to keep it going without eating it. Because of the short window combos have, an execution can wind up dropping it if performed late. Points awarded to the player diminish over time if the same weapon is used, thus varying up the killing method awards the most points. At the end of every stage, the player is ranked on their performance under six categories. Killings, Boldness, Combos, Time, Flexibility, and Mobility. The three most important are Killings, Boldness, and Combos, as all three are listed in the end game score at the top right of the screen. Killings is measured by what killed an enemy. More points are given towards executions while gun and melee kills are earned less. Boldness points are earned when a player performs an action while an enemy is alerted to their presence. I've already explained combos, so I'll skip over it. Time is how long it took the player to complete the level. For the longer stages, time is generous, but on the shorter ones, time might as well be as important as combos and boldness. Time is always counting even when a player hits R to restart or is going to car, so don't dilly-dally. The only way to reset time is by restarting the level via the pause menu, which is escape. Flexibility is how much variation in their killing methods the player used. It and mobility, which is how much distance the player traveled in a level, are the least important factors when it comes to ranking. After the player's score has been tallied, they are given a breakdown of what achievements they earned within a level, a playstyle, and a letter grade ranging from F- to A+. Points go towards unlocking new masks and weapons for Jacket to use. Getting flashbacks of Air Ride is, once again, I'm talking about the music first in this section. Whenever someone says video game music is unremarkable, I point them to two series. Devil May Cry, and Hotline. If you may not know, I'm a huge fan of bumping electronic sound, which is the entirety of Hotline's music. From the smooth beats of Crystals by Moon to the aggressive synth backing of Scattle's Knock Knock, Hotline Miami's soundtrack goes hard in all the right places. This is one of those times that I can't really say what my favorite piece of music from this game is because I think they are all equally good. Each one is quintessentially Hotline Miami, and that says a lot because even the best of games sometimes don't have an entirely consistent OST. It's like each music track has a purpose within the game. It's all thematic. Take Jacket's safe house music, Deep Cover, versus Biker's safe house music, It's Safe Now. First off, both those names are telling, as Deep Cover seems more like Jacket isn't hiding because of what he's done and what he's about to do, while It's Safe Now basically states that nothing bad is going to happen to Biker. He has nothing to worry about, while Jacket has to be looking over his shoulder at all times. Going over to the structure of the tracks, It's Safe Now is a lot more chill than Deep Cover. Safe features more standardized club beats, helping to showcase that besides his thrill-seeking behavior, Biker is a regular person, while Deep Cover has longer, more drawn-out sections with added scatting, portraying Jacket as more mentally conflicted. Like, the scatting can be taken as the voices inside Jacket's head as he does have three of them. Stepping away from the music, the game delivers on exactly what it wanted to do. Fast frantic combat, where death is one mistake away. Do I like hurting people in Hotline Miami? Yes and there are a lot of reasons why. My first being the controls. Hotline is so smooth when it comes to playing it, and the only times I feel that I died from bad controls was because of my own error. That mostly stems from Hotline having high reaction time in my own blundering ways. That's a sign of well-made controls if I'm dying due to my own mistakes. And off shooting from this, I love how fast the game is. If Hotline was a tad bit slower or even faster, the whole entire game balance would be thrown off. As if it was too slow, it wouldn't be Hotline, but if it was too fast, it would be unplayable. Hotline hits this perfect sweet spot where playing recklessly is actually beneficial, to a degree, because of how enemies work. The godlike reaction time sometimes might not kick in, allowing for some interesting scenarios. Second, and probably the biggest reason for why I like Hotline's combat, is that enemy feedback from damage is spec. Spectacular. I'm all about how enemies react to damage because if they don't, you get bullet spongy enemies that are unfun to fight. See my Operation Raccoon City video for me complaining 
more. Since mostly every enemy in the game dies to one hit, there needed to be something to showcase just how paper thin everyone is. That's where the death animations come in. Enemies can die in quite a few ways when struck with an attack, such as having their midsection blown apart to having their head completely explode. That's not even getting into the executions. It helps that enemy bodies never despawn so the player can see just how much carnage they wrought out in a level. My third and final reason for why I like the gameplay is the emphasis on variation. There's a lot of strategy involved within Hotline when it comes to weapons and trying to accrue a high score. A player can go for the more safer options like guns, which tangent outside of the silenced pistol all feel great, but especially the shotguns, but those won't earn as many points as say a melee weapon, a throwing weapon, or an execution. That's not to say that a player can't get a high score with guns, I mostly got A's to B's during my playthrough, but if I mixed it up even more I would have gotten mostly A's. That's not even counting the masks and what they do, adding another layer. All three of these aspects I mentioned blend together so well to create this chaotic top-down shooter. Replayability is the last thing I'll mention because Hotline has that in spades all because of the high score. There's both an online and friends leaderboard where you can compete to see who can score the most points in level, and trust me, some of the scores are insane. My only wish is that you could watch a person's level replay to see how they completed it. My biggest complaint in Hotline is room size. Many of the earlier levels are small and tight, helping to emphasize the Devil May Care style of gameplay the game is going for. That gets thrown out the proverbial window once the rooms get big. There are a few problems with the larger room sizes, but the two I want to bring up are getting sniped from off screen and being forced to play like a coward. There is no feeling quite like going on a high combo string only to get attacked from off screen by a guy you didn't know was there forcing a restart. That's what happens in a lot of the later rooms, because you only know a room's enemy layout once you've played it. Even with that knowledge, as this isn't my first time playing Hotline, you'll still have to clear a room where one mistake leads to death. That's what leads into my second problem, playing like a boring fuck. I don't like using the door strategy, but with some of the larger rooms, I can't think of any way else to safely complete them. Bottlenecking with a shotgun is mind-numbing, but when every enemy is alerted to one blast and crowds around to investigate, it's the safest option. Especially on room 2 of Hot and Heavy and Assault. I have a special dislike of Hot and Heavy because of its room 2 being way too large with no relative safe spots and having patrolling enemies. Making matters worse is that the player starts the room out by knocking an enemy down with a door, thus they're already put on the back foot. The player has to go into the room knowing what they need to do and the execution of their plan is much simpler thinking about it than acting out. Enemies aren't technically set to the same pattern, so sometimes an enemy who generally stays put might decide to wander around. There's also dogs in this room and I swear every time I looked for them they always spotted me first and turned me into a chew toy. This is where I will go on to mention that I don't care for how the look ahead is implemented as I think it swings way too violently into the direction the player wants to look at which can lead to getting killed by someone off screen. Separate from those two issues, Trauma is not a fun level to play through. Four stealth in a game that didn't need it and drunk controls? How about no? The only good things I can say about the level is that I like that the music track uses an EKG meter as part of the beat and that the way that the level wants you to go through it is at least simple. I still wouldn't have included a stealth level, but it's not like Trauma is Tenshu. Hotline Miami is a fantastic time. While I still don't like the large room sizes towards the end game, everything else within Hotline covers for that issue. Get it on Switch or Steam, your preference. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> my